welcome to QI, where tonight we're on the move with K for Kinetic. Good evening, welcome to Watch Mojo UK, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 10 QI moments. How long would your penis be? <laughs> Before we begin, if you enjoy this video, please subscribe for more great content. For this list, we're looking at the greatest little gems of banter, knowledge and brilliance that QI has offered us over the years. Sometimes they make us laugh, sometimes they make us think, but they never fail to be quite interesting. Oh! oh. And... Green! Ooh. Wow, cool! Ooh. Nothing. <laughs> it's well, not popping, weird. though. Number 10, how many moons does the Earth have? Round 2. Before QI, the question of how many moons this planet of ours has was a simple one. It's one. One moon. The Earth has one moon which is made of cheese. But after QI, the first series twisted many a melon with its reveal that there are in fact two moons orbiting Earth. But the answer is that there are two moons. One is the one we know called the moon. The other is called Kruisne. It's three miles across and orbits the world every 770 years. So when the question comes up again in Series B, whipping boy Alan Davis answers with confidence to Claxons. Two. Oh! Oh, 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 dear, oh, dear, oh, dear. We did this last series. Yes, but Alan, that was last year. It there have been like... three more discovered. Yes, in the time since the first series went out and the second series was researched, even more moons were found revolving around our humble planet, making the old fact obsolete, and Alan the hapless victim of the show's trademark cruel scoring system. Some people say they aren't really moons, but on the other hand, what else can you call them? They orbit the Earth and they are, to some extent, like moons. They're not visible to the human right. eye. Number nine, Stephen's boyhood tailor. My prep school tailors were called Gorringe, really funnily enough. Really? We get our uniforms made, yeah. This moment begins innocently enough, with Stephen making the mental leap from finding a rhyme for orange to recalling his prep school tailor, Gorringe. It's a fact so in tune with the very essence of Stephen Fry that Sean Locke can't resist engaging in a bit of guerrilla class warfare. And then a tailor <laughs> for like a suit you wear when you're five. In fairness, it's actually Bill Bailey that sights the target, but it's Sean that pulls the trigger, opening fire with, Were you born in the 1850s? <laughs> Were you born in the 1850s? <laughs> Bill and Alan then follow suit, and the three lob grenade after grenade at Stephen and this seemingly other half posh upbringing. Lord! <laughs> what do you want, what's that like to wear a cravat on the cross country run? Right? <laughs> Number eight, when was the First World War first named as such? As is often the way with QI, there's a seemingly obvious yet wrong answer concerning when the First World War earned its name, which was so kindly offered up without second thought by Bill Bailey. The assassination of Archduke Ferdinand. Uh, you think they called it the First World War straight before away? Before it started. Yeah. <laughs> As it turns out, however, there were many wrong answers, and David Mitchell hit upon every one of them while trying to clarify how each previous wrong answer wasn't what he said. Excuse me! I think I said... I think what I said, people in the box, is after 1939. Yes. What ensues is a battle between the pedantic, precise, angry logic of David Mitchell and the cold, detached judgement of the QI scorers. <laughs> Mitchell's logic may have been sound, his thinking may have been correct, but no one outsmarts the QI klaxon. Why don't you just type, Mitchell is a cop? <laughs> Number seven, Ben Hur. If things had gone to plan and Michael Palin hosted QI, Stephen Fry and Alan Davis would have been on equal footing as team captains. Unfortunately for Alan, that wasn't to be. Someone thought, sitting about, and thought, I'm going to write a book about Roman chariot racing. Yeah. When he can't quite accept the idea that an American would choose to write about the very un-American topic of chariot racing, Stephen comes down on him like the fist of an angry but liberal-minded god. You wanker! <laughs> <laughs> Shakespeare writing about Romans. <laughs> At the height of his rage, it's unclear if Stephen calls Alan a wanker or if Stephen impersonating Alan calls the very dead Lou Wallace a wanker. What is clear just by looking at him is that Alan wishes he'd never said anything. So while he was being governor of New Mexico, he was able to write a, a best-selling... Yes. Yeah. It was a warm morning in Rome. <laughs> <laughs> Number six, why don't we have more women as guests on QI? With a rare 50% female panel, fan favourite Ronnie Ancona, and future host Sandy Toxvig versus Jack D and Alan Davis, this episode became a battle of the sexes. When the question of why so few female guests appear on the show came up, Ronnie and Sandy both go for it. I think that there is a, a scientific, possibly, relationship between a sense of humour and the male sex organ. 
People are always laughing at mine. Yeah, well, there you are. <laughs> Sandy provides some deep sociological and psychological reasons, but Ronnie dives into a bizarre, surreal, and long-winded explanation about a female comedian farm and ignores Jack's attempt to interject. It's just that we just don't see them because they're systematically rounded up and kept in a pen just yes. outside Harwich. <laughs> While this allows the female-led discussion to reach critical mass, it also provides Jack with perfect comedic timing for his admittedly chauvinistic put-down. Is it because once you get them started, they don't shut up? <laughs> Number five, smoke versus fire. During a discussion of old-timey firefighting practices, Rob Brydon attempts to weigh in with an important distinction. It's not fire that kills people. Yeah. It's not the fire yeah. that kills the people. <laughs> it's speaking. a byproduct of the fire. And I wonder if any of you know what that byproduct <laughs> is. When Clive Anderson begins to cross-examine him, Brydon shuts him down with gusto. Clive is further chastised in the form of a silencing courtesy of Lord Fry, allowing Rob to step into the chairman role, suddenly grabbing control of the show to give an impromptu lecture on smoke versus fire via the Socratic method. Uh, <laughs> Clive, you were right. Smoke. It's the smoke. <laughs> With Stephen offering no resistance, Rob leads the panel to conclude that it's smoke inhalation, not the flames, that kills. It's a payoff that, on any other show, wouldn't have gotten quite as many laughs. And if we can't breathe, what do we do, Dom? We die. We die! <laughs> Number four, Rob Brydon and Ben Miller at last. No. Well, it is, we can't actually touch. Let, let's just, let's just... <laughs> 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 Given that both are actors, comedians, and associates of Steve Coogan, it's likely this wasn't the first time someone noted the resemblance between Rob Brydon and Ben Miller. I listen to you, it's like listening to me. Yeah. <laughs> but with the pair on the same panel, Brydon and Miller were forced to address the confusion as the issue reaches its unexpected apex. With Rob riding Ben's scientific coattails, the two become increasingly like-minded until their celebration of sameness makes way for narcissistic curiosity. <laughs> Post-embrace, the Brilla twins ignore the implication of notions like sexuality, incest, or romance, and instead praise themselves for their above-average kissing skills. Now I know why my wife married me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Number three, ceiling. In classic QI form, Alan is led into a trap involving the disproved spelling rule, I before E, except after C. C. Oh! <laughs> Isn't a rule. But while it's Alan that takes the dive, Lee Mack is the one who winds up bearing the brunt of Fry's fury. As Stephen explains that there are more examples of English words not conforming to the rule than those that do, Lee offers up ceiling, a word which does conform. Ceiling! No, that's C E I. Oh. <laughs> but the more Stephen tries to explain the faultness of the rule, the more fixated on ceiling Lee becomes, presenting it with everything from blind hope to sheer desperation. Ceiling! <laughs> I may explode at any minute. Stephen finally shuts the comedian down with disdain and finality. Are you, are you cannot be that stupid. You've really you cannot be that stupid. <laughs> Number two, the giant tortoise. Fittingly, this discussion on why it took 300 years for the giant tortoise to get its scientific name builds slowly. They thought it was a normal tortoise, but it's but closer, is what I was going to say. <laughs> Sean Locke meekly suggests that they thought giant tortoise was already pretty good, while David Mitchell works out a joke about distance perception in real time, Alan suggests the tortoise would sue, and Joe Brand remains silent. But when it's finally revealed that the setback was that the creature is delicious, the panel erupts. Go nine of them. We'll eat eight. Absolutely. <laughs> Led largely by Alan and David, the idea of gluttonous researchers having an unrestrained nosh on their tortoise specimen is taken to its absurdest limits, and Stephen's attempts to contextualize things only derails the discussion further. They are now protected. <laughs> All I the 12 species. They're not, they're that delicious, they can't be. Well, <laughs> say, yeah, we protected them, they're all in there, no need to look. <laughs> Before we unveil our top pick, here are a few honourable mentions. In fact, my father grew up in the same street, literally the same street as Anthony Hopkins. Yeah. In England, we live in houses. I genuinely believed that it was possible that after Christ's ascension into heaven, mm. the rings of Saturn were where he put his foreskin. One of the questions <laughs> was, do you worry about your health a lot? And so how can you answer moderately to I worry, I moderately worry about my health a lot. I worry about my health a lot a little bit. Number one, they say of the Acropolis where the Parthenon is. Bloody hell, Stephen. <laughs> this better be good. This offcut from the E-Series opener on engineering starts strong out of the gate with a low-hanging observation from Rob Brydon. 
Bryden goes on to dominate the laughs by agreeing with and repeating snippets of Fry's notes in a knowing manner, but this clip changes direction completely when Stephen loses the plot while trying to introduce the next fact. They say of the Acro Acro Acropolis where, where the Parthenon is, <laughs> Stumbling through the wording multiple times only to forget the rest of his sentence, Stephen is pounced on by Jimmy Carr and Bill Bailey, who quickly turn the botch line into a multi-part musical number. It turns into a four-man sing-song pilot that leaves Stephen and the viewers breathless and in tears. But there are no straight lines! <laughs> Do you agree with our picks? Check out these other great clips from WatchMojo UK and subscribe for more great content.